Today, I want to, uh, I think it's kind of ironic, everybody's like wearing a lot of Superman shirts, but we're going to be looking at a Superman. I want to bring you a message this morning called Atmospheric Pressures. Atmospheric Pressures. Uh, have you ever had those days where you feel invincible? Anybody? You feel invincible? You, you, you can conquer the world. You could take anything. You're like getting out of bed and say, come on, world. Come on, devil. And you just, you just, come on, I can take this. I can handle this. Maybe you went to a church service. Maybe you got an evangelistical service. I don't know what you did. Maybe you just ate your Wheaties. I don't know what you got in you, but you just feel like, man, I could do whatever comes at me. Anybody ever had one of those days? I've, I've had some of those days. I've had some other days. But then there's those days. You know what I'm talking about? There's some days where you just feel like, man, somebody put some kryptonite in your Wheaties. You just, you can't, you can't go forward. You can't, you don't even want to get out of bed. Melissa turns over to me sometimes in the morning and says, I don't want to go to school. You know, she just don't want to get out of bed. And, and we hear the snooze alarm go off millions and millions of times. And so there's some days that we just don't feel like we can do anything to a place that we almost feel what I call capeless. Let's look at one of King David's days in his life. In Psalms 55, 1 through 7, it says this, Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my cry for help. Please listen and answer me, for I am overwhelmed by the troubles, and my enemies shout at me, making loud and wicked threats, and they bring me trouble on me and angrily hunt me down, and my heart pounds within my chest. Can you hear the intensity of David's voice that his enemies are coming against him? And This is not a day that he feels invincible, and this is not a day that he feels like he can conquer everything. But God, will you please hear my prayer? There's so much coming against me. My heart pounds in my chest, and the terror of death assaults me, and fear and trembling overwhelm me, and I can't stop shaking. And oh, listen to this part. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, that I could fly away and rest. And I would fly far away to the quiet of the wilderness. See, sometimes we, things overwhelm us so much that we think if we can just get off by ourselves and we can get away from the troubles and we can isolate ourselves, it'll make everything better. But can I tell you that sometimes in the isolation, it makes the feeling of being capeless even worse. Because we isolate ourselves from everything that can help us and everything that can benefit us. And, and instead of running and getting away by ourselves, we need to run to the Almighty and say, God, please restore whatever needs to be restored in my soul. But David said, if I just had some wings, if I just had a cape, <laughs> and I could just fly away from this place and become what you've called me to do. See, this was a point in David's life where uh, the prophet Nathan had come and just read his mail. David, King David was at the place where uh, it was the time and the season where David was supposed to be off with, the, with his soldiers at war. This was the time that the kings went to war. But he decided to stay behind. And, and through the events of, of what, doing what he wanted to do, he finds himself in the place of uh, getting into an affair with Bathsheba and uh, not only getting into an affair with her but also getting to the place of finding out that she's pregnant and also finding out to the place that oh I need to kill her husband so it doesn't look like I'm the one that did this and it was him but he died in war and so he's making up this whole scenario and Nathan is coming to him and saying look God knows what you did oh that I would have wings that I could fly from this situation that I could get away from all this. And it's in the moments that we, we do wrong that we become to feel capeless. That it takes away our power. That it takes away the ability to do what God's called us to do. And now all of a sudden we're sitting on the sidelines wishing we weren't even here anymore. This is how David was feeling. When defeat, think about this, write this down, do whatever you got to remember this. When defeat feels inevitable, call on the one who can do the impossible. Amen? See, there's some times in our life where we've done some things and we realize, okay, I can't get past this on my own. I can't undo this. 
I, 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 I need something to help me out in life. When you feel like defeat is inevitable, you need to call on the one that can do the impossible. God wants to do something in your life. In today's message, Atmospheric Pressures, I want to inspect the air that you're breathing. Everybody just take a breath right now. Just, just take a deep breath. In. Oh, okay, I can smell the popcorn. I can smell the popcorn. Don't do that no more. So it's like, it's like you know, it, it's, it, you're breathing air right now. It's oxygen. You need it. If I was to come to you and hold your windpipe for a while, you would definitely realize that you need air, that you've got to have it in order to live. It's, it's the way our bodies are made up. It's what God's done within us to know that what we need is around us. But I want to talk about a different air here today. I want to talk about the spiritual atmosphere that surrounds you right now. And I want to ask you this question. What atmosphere are you adapting to? Mm. See, because there's the atmosphere of the flesh, and then there's the atmosphere of the spirit. Which one are you adapting to? See, because the one you hang out in the most is the one that you will adapt to the fastest. See, if we, if we surround our saint, ourselves with the things of the world, that's the air that you begin to breathe. And it's the air that you depend on. It's the air that keeps you going because you've got to have the things of the world and you've got to have the things of the flesh. And it's the atmosphere that you have adapted and that you depend on. But in the atmosphere of the spirit... The Bible says that you're to walk and you're to live and you're to breathe in the spirit, to be in the things of God, to be in his atmosphere. And so when we've adapted ourselves over here to the flesh, we can't, uh, we can't take what is here in the spirit. And quite the opposite, if you are in the things of God and, and that's how you live your life and you respect the things of God and you follow the things of God and it's, oh, that's the air I breathe. Then when it comes to the place of over here, I can't function here. I, I can't breathe here because I've adapted to the things of the Spirit. And so I want to talk about that here today, how there are atmospheric pressures. And what are you depending on to keep you alive at this moment in your life? I believe the enemy is trying to destroy the church from the inside out. The Bible calls the enemy the prince of the power of the air. And his number one goal is to get you to depend on his atmosphere. We cannot survive on his atmosphere, and adapting to the world's atmosphere is not an option. The prince of the power of the air. I believe that he's trying to suffocate the church. We are a new church. We, we were established uh, at the end of last year, and, and we uh, started meeting in this building in February, and we've been here ever since, and as you look around, things have grown, and the God is blessing, and God is doing things, and we are continuing to build, and we are, but let me tell you something, even in the freshness and the newness of, of this church, the devil is trying to choke our families. I've had testimony after testimony of people that have told me, thank you for what you're doing in this place. Thank you for the EWC. It's made my life better. It's, it's made my family better. Oh, it's brought life to my teenagers again. It's doing something in my family. But once in a while, I hear something where someone is having an issue and it, <laughs> the devil <laughs> trying to choke them out. And I won't stand for it. And I won't let the devil do what he wants to do in this place because we have set this place up with the atmosphere of God. And how dare you try to come against these people? How dare you try to come against this church? We will breathe the atmosphere of God. You will not choke these people out. Ooh. we got to depend on the atmosphere of the Spirit. There's a, a preacher by the name of, uh, uh, God, this is just off the top of my head, Jensen Franklin, Jensen Franklin. And he preached a message once called the Python Spirit. Anybody ever heard that? That's a phenomenal message. And, and how the, the python is a, is a large snake that when it coils around its victim, it'll wait 
Listen, come on, somebody, somebody, listen. It'll wait for the victim to take a breath. And once the victim, the python squeezes. To where once the victim has taken a breath, now it cannot take another. Because it is constricting what is within. That is what the enemy and the devil is trying to do to each and every single one of us. If, if, yeah, go ahead and breathe the things of God. But when you do I guarantee you, something's going to go wrong in your life. And you thought God would handle it. And you thought God would bring you through it. But all of a sudden, you realize that, that, that it didn't change all of a sudden. And he lies to you and makes you feel like God wasn't there. And so all of a sudden, when you breathe the things of God... <clears throat> God wasn't there for me. Well, God didn't answer my prayer. Well, maybe you didn't change something in your life. Maybe God couldn't move at that time. I don't know what you did to tie his hands, but all of a sudden the enemy is just uh, it's constricting more. So if we learn to stay here, breathing the things, breathing the things of God then it becomes easier to know when we come into trouble and when we come into things we shouldn't because all of a sudden, I shouldn't be here. That isn't anywhere I need to hang out anymore. Those aren't the people I need to be with anymore. That isn't the way I need to talk anymore. Those aren't the things I need to participate in anymore because anytime I get close to them, anytime, I can breathe. It's the atmosphere of God. It's the atmosphere of God. Acts 17, 28 says this, For in him we live, come on somebody, in him we live, we move, and we exist. In him. What atmosphere are you moving, living, and existing in? And I, I promise you, if it's the wrong atmosphere, if it's, it's the wrong in the fleshly atmosphere. I promise you think you're living for a moment. Mm, come on. You think you're doing okay for a moment. Before you know it, though, things will start breaking down inside you and things will start uh, going wrong and things will start catching up with you. And before you know it, you are <clears throat> choked out within the wrong atmosphere. In Him we live, we move, we exist. And it says, as some of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. His offspring. I have offsprings. I have my son, Jean Marc. I have my daughter, Paige. They are my offsprings. They, 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 they come uh, from me and, and their mother. You know, it's their offspring. They're my offspring. I love that the author said that, that we are his offspring. We got to realize that when we're born, uh, before you were born, you are in your mother's womb and you were surrounded by something called an uh, amniotic fluid. And this amniotic fluid isn't just something that you're swimming in within the womb, but it is actually a fluid that you're breathing. And it's racing through you. And it's, it's something that's within you. And it's, it's a whole new atmosphere within inside your mother's womb. But this fluid has a purpose for the baby. It helps the baby move within the womb. It helps with bone growth and lung development. It keeps the temperature just right within inside the mother for the baby. It also helps, helps protect the baby from danger. And so there's some benefits to an at atmospheric uh, 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 environment. And, and where you're at. But while in the womb, the baby, uh, while, when the baby comes out and the baby is born, the baby will start to reject the amniotic fluid and release it from its body. That's why the nurse is so uh, adamant about making the baby cry to get the air lungs, to get the airway clear of this amniotic fluid. And all of a sudden, whereas once breathing one atmosphere, now is taking a <gasps> breath. In oxygen. And something begins to happen. A transformation within the child. The, the lungs begin to open. And blood vessels begin to start uh, forming the way they're supposed. Something happens within the child. A new atmosphere begins to take place. But I guarantee you, the child cannot look up at the nurse and say, I want to go back to the atmosphere that I was in. There's no switching back and forth from an amniotic fluid to oxygen. Once you're out, you're out. Once you're breathing the oxygen, you're breathing the oxygen. If it was to try to go back, it would suffocate. 
Case in point, at our church-wide baptism coming up, if you were to go in the water and, and say, I want to live under the water, we would not be having a baptism, but we would be having a funeral. Because you can't do it. We can't go back. I guarantee you, once you have knelt at the altar, and once you have given your life to Christ, you are no longer breathing one atmosphere, but now you have taken on a whole new way of living, a whole new way of breathing, a whole new way of acting, and you cannot and you will not go back because if you do, it's... Something begins to happen within you. You can't go back to the old atmosphere. In fact, David said this in Psalms 51. He says, create in me a new, clean heart, O God. Filled with clean thoughts and right desires. Please, O God, don't cast me aside. Don't toss me aside. Banished forever from your presence. David knew where he needed to be. He knew the, where his, he, he, he needed to, his, his breath would come from. David knew where he would survive. He said, don't banish me from your presence. Don't listen to this. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me again the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to others. And they, guilty like me, will repent and return to you. See, David knew that he had to depend on the Spirit of God. And the only way that he was going to be able to go forward, the only way he was going to be able to accomplish what he was called to do was being in the presence of God. Let me show you something. That scripture says, don't take your spirit from me. That word spirit is very important. Because in the Hebrew, that word uh, in, the, in the Hebrew is raha. Come on, everybody say that. One, two, three. Say, raha. You got to get the phlegm in there. <sighs> raha. That's what spirit means, the raha, which means this, air in motion. How many have ever had an oscillating fan? Well, the fan just kind of does this number. We were in Costa Rica once, years ago. We, uh, we went to go visit a friend of ours that is a pastor up there, pastor, um, uh, remind me of his name. Alan, Pastor Alan, he's got a church in Costa Rica, and he invited us to come as guests to preach in his church and, and to have a small uh, vacation over there. Well, I'm not much of a jungle person. I am very much Holiday Inn, Marriott. Uh, I'm not a tent guy. I don't like to camp um, unless there is a Holiday Inn in the middle of the campsite, and it's got electricity, TV, air conditioning, what have you. And so he set us up in this um, villa. Yeah, this villa. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's in the middle of the, the rainforest. You know, there's stuff all around. In fact, we had monkeys at our doorstep in the mornings. And, you know, you're expecting a room service, but you open the door and it's like, yeah, yeah. you know, it's monkeys. And... and and you, you look, and the trees are shaking. And you're like, oh, my God, what's coming? And it's just a trump, troop of monkeys. That's what they call it, a troop of monkeys going through the, the forest there. And so we're there, and um, the, the place has no air condition except for some air in motion. <laughs> and it's this oscillating thing that's stuck above our bed. And I am just like, I, I'm hot anyway when I sleep, even at our house. Melissa's got blankets and covers and and igloos and Eskimos and all this stuff on top of her. And, and, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm just like, I'm so hot during the day. Even with the fan, I was like, I don't want any covers. Just blah. And so it was even worse in Costa Rica because it was like, like just, just, it was humid. But it, it, oh, it was just so, I didn't want anything on. Plus, so there's this oscillating fan above us, this long thing. It's kind of like, long like that. And it'd go, like that. And so when it pointed down, it hit us. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. and then it go away. It's like, no, 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 no. And it go away. And then it come back. And it's like, oh. and it's like no, no, no. And it's, it's like constant. It's like, God, is there a setting? Can we just point it down? You know, but it was air in motion. It'd come on you and then it'd go away. And it'd come on you and it'd go away. Just like a regular oscillating fan. But see, David realized that I need your spirit. 
I need your breath, your roha. I need that in my life. I can't survive within another atmosphere. I will suffocate without you. I, I don't know if that's where you are in your life, but man, that, that's me all the way. God, I will suffocate without you. I've got to have you in my life. I've got to be able to breathe you. If, if I want some patience, if I want to be sound of mind, if, if I want to know that I'm smack dab in the middle, of you, God, I've got to have your raha in my life. See, we see Aaron motion in the Old Testament uh, many times. We see the story of Samson. How many remember Samson? He, he was supposedly a big guy. I actually think he was probably a normal looking guy like myself, but something happened with inside of him when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. I don't believe he was muscle bound and, and all this stuff because the, the people that were after him said, find out the secret to his strength. And see, if, it, if he was just buffed, and he, they would know. I know the secret of his strength. He picks things up and he puts them down. That's, that, that would be the secret of his strength. But they, they said, find out that I don't know what makes him so strong. But it says every time Samson got into a situation, it said what? The spirit of the Lord came upon. Ooh, no, 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 no. Ooh, there's the spirit of the Lord upon him. And then when he was able to defeat whatever he needed to defeat, it says that the spirit went away. And so it wasn't this. So it hopped. It was something that came. It was something that went. And so in the Old Testament, the raha, the, the breath of God was upon them. We even see this in Ezekiel when uh, God showed Ezekiel the vision of the dry bones. He said he walked amongst the valley and he saw dry bones scattered across the land and scattered across the valley. And God said, uh, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel said, I don't know, God, uh, only you know. And he says, speak to the four winds and command the wind to come upon them. And it says that when the breath of God filled the valley in unison, Every single bone snapped back together, made a person, and all of a sudden, (gasps) a breath across the valley. Back then, the air, the breath, the spirit jumped. But in the New Testament, oh, somebody say, thank you, Jesus, for the New Testament, the New Testament, the New Covenant. In the New Testament, we see a new atmosphere and a a new breath and a new uh, revitalization with inside the church and the body of Christ. In Acts 4.31, it says, and when they had prayed, my God, when's the last time you prayed? Something happens when you pray. And when they prayed, it's setting us up. There's a comma there that says something's about to happen after they pray. I don't know what you're going through in life. And I don't know your situation. And I don't know how (gasps) ah, you are in life right now. But God says when they prayed, something began to happen. It says the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. How many know that when you're in the wrong atmosphere, you can't speak the word of God in boldness? Because everything you're supposed to speak against is everything that you're doing in your life. Come on, somebody. How can you speak against it if you're part of it? Hmm said it filled them. See, in the New Testament, spirit no longer means air and motion. Now we come to the Greek. So you got to realize that the same word in different places doesn't always mean the same thing. In the Old Testament, spirit meant air and motion. But in the New Testament, the, the, the word breath uh, no longer was roha, but now it was pneuma. There's a whole nother meaning for it. There's a whole nother way of looking at it. The Greek word for spirit was pneuma or breath, which also means a current of air and a blast of breath. How many need a blast of breath in your life right now? Uh, Come on, somebody. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know where you're at, but you need, my God, if you're hot and you stand in front of the fan, oh, it feels so good. It's not oscillating anymore. It's not coming and going, but now it's a current blast. It's something that's on you all the time. It's going to keep you where you need you. It's going to do something in your life. My God, stay on me. Stay on me, God. I need your breath. Ooh. And it comes with you. And it stays with you. It doesn't come and go anymore. But now we have the opportunity of the Spirit of God living with us. 
You see, in the Old Testament, they didn't have that privilege. They couldn't say the Spirit of God lives within me. Samson could only say that the Spirit of God comes upon me. But now we can say the Spirit of God lives within me. It's a current blast. It's a constant on my life. My God, I believe God never inhales. <laughs> God just exhales. He just, whoosh, he's just constantly blowing on your life. And he just wants, man, he just wants you to stay in that atmosphere because he knows the minute he stops, <clears throat> I can't breathe. Acts 2.17 says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. I'll pour out my pneuma. I'm not going to pour out my raha anymore, but I'm going to pour out my pneuma upon my people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. How many need some pneuma in your life? You need a constant breath of air. You need something blowing on you from the heavenlies 24-7. God, don't take your spirit from from me. Mm. David understood that it was a spirit in motion. He understood that it came and went. God, but I know how it feels when you're breathing on me. I know how it feels on my life. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. I need a pneuma upon my life. You can't switch back and forth. See, because there's a difference between the atmosphere of the flesh and the atmosphere of the spirit. The enemy will do everything he can to bring an atmospheric pressure against you. To choke out different areas of your life. Remember the word? We just said it. The pneuma means a current of air, a blast, or a breath. Can I remind you of another word? Go and put it up there. Pneuma is where we get our word pneumonia from. Anybody know what pneumonia is? It's an, infl inflammary, uh, an inflammation condition making it hard to take a breath. It's something that happens within your lungs that, <clears throat> I can't breathe. <clears throat> it's a pneumonia. It's, it's a condition that comes against us. And I believe that the enemy is trying to bring a spiritual pneumonia over this generation of the church. And if we can't breathe, we'll give up. Hmm. If we can't take the breath that we need, where we are, we'll give up and we'll try to find a place that where we can breathe. And let me tell you something. The devil will lie to you because you'll come in a church, you'll come in a place like this, and, and you'll, you'll hear a message and it'll begin to affect you or convict you or do something in your life and, and you don't want to hear it. And you say, well, I'm not going there anymore. I'm not going to that church anymore. I'm going to leave. And all of a sudden, the pressure seems out, off of you out there. And you think, okay, I can breathe better out here. See, there's a difference between the enemy choking you and God convicting you. Hmm. And see, because the devil wants to bring a pneumonia on you. And if he can get you out of this atmosphere and get you into something you can't handle, he'll bring you to the place where you uh, can't breathe. See, because with the pneumonia within your lungs, it, it begins to form a, a pus. And it, I know that's kind of gross. I know that's why you're just eating popcorn and you're not eating jello. Come on, somebody. And so uh, you, you begin to form some pus, some fluid type substance within your lungs. And what did we say at the beginning? You can't go back. You can't breathe fluid again. You can't breathe what you used to. But the devil's trying to bring back into your life to where you once thought you were stable, but now you can't handle it because you've already adapted to the things of God I can't take this maybe what the preacher said was true maybe what that church had was true but I can't breathe because you're starting to reject that which God intended for you to breathe the devil gives you the illusion that things are easier but really, you're just slowly suffocating. You took a breath for a reason, and then God filled it with purpose. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You took a breath for a reason. Come on, don't give me this stuff that you were a oops. Oh, my parents, they just, they just one night, whoops. 
No, no, you're not an oops. You were planned. You were designed. You were formed. God gave you a reason. He said, take a breath. And when you (gasps) took a breath, he said, there's purpose in your life. I can do something with him. I can utilize him as long as he (sighs) breathes my atmosphere. Takes a breath where I need him. Takes a breath where I created him. Oh, I could use him. I could use her. I put purpose in that person. Look at this. Back in the book of Acts, it says this. They were filled. Come on, somebody say the word filled. One, two, three. Filled with the Spirit. They were filled with, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they were filled with. With a constant blast of air. Oh, come on, come on. I, I don't know. See, we were here yesterday making the backdrop for you to take pictures, so you better go take pictures so I didn't make that thing in vain. And so, but we were blowing up some balloons. And let me tell you something those balloons are filled with my pneuma. Come on. I, I was like, <laughs> and then one got away from me. <laughs> but I still filled some with my pneuma, it was in there. But I love this filled. filled. That was pretty good, right? I didn't plan that. That one written down. But look, the word filled means this. To furnish, to finish, and to complete. See, when God breathes in you. See, there's a journey in your life. There's a journey. You start to believe God a little more. Oh, you start really committing your life to him. And then he wraps you off, ties you off. You're filled. You're furnished. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do in life. I know I don't think it's, it's possible. I don't think I, I, I can do it. I don't think. No, you've been furnished. Everything God's called you to do and everything God's called you to be, he put inside of you what you need to be able to finish it and to complete it. He filled you with his pneuma. Ooh. See, some of y'all don't think you can finish something. God says, I gave you everything you need to complete it. All you got to do is do it. I put... When you were a teenage boy. When you got serious about God at the age of 16. When everything went wrong in your life in the early ages of 20 and you still turned back to me. I filled you. And I furnished you with what you need to do in this place at this time. And I don't know what God's called you to do, but I know that he's furnished you to do it. Don't let the atmospheres of this world confuse you and think, I can't, I can't do it. Get where you need to be, and I promise you before you know it, oh, that feels good. Ooh. Is this helping anybody today? Come on. Or am I just running out of breath and sweating in my suit? Come on, somebody. Look at this real quick, real quick. I normally give you points throughout the message, but I'm just going to shoot some quick ones at you here today, and we're going to get you out of here. Look at this. Numa, I believe that, that uh, God, is, 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 uh, God is pouring out a Numa on this church. Whew. How many need a Numa on your life? How many need a fresh... Some of y'all on your finances. Some of you on your businesses. I don't know where you need it, but God says, come on, just get in the right atmosphere. Get in the right atmosphere. You know, I could go stand over there and that fan will never hit me. But if I get in the right place in the right position, oh, come on. Come on. Frank wanted to stand up here and play keyboard with his cape in front of the fan. You know, he just wanted to, you know, just, you know, so, you know, it's that, that's that flow, that flow, that flow. Let me show you three things real quick. When God breathes on your life, when he breathes on your life and it's that constant flow, this is one thing he's doing. He's placing conception in your life. What is conception? It's a beginning or a start, the ability to form or understand concepts, uh, a, a, a plan, a design. An idea or a thought. He's conceiving something within you. 
Some, some of y'all, you're conceiving right now as you're praying for God. Just, just the breath of God on my life. Come on, somebody just lift your hand and say, God, breathe on me. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. Come on. Some of y'all are conceiving right now. I don't know. You know, I'm not talking about babies. I'm not talking about babies. Some of y'all, you, know, you put your hand down. No, I'm not talking about babies. I'm talking about in the spirit. God is beginning to do something in you. Man or woman, it doesn't matter. You're conceiving something. I don't know where you are in your life right now, but there might be a starting point within you where you said, God, I need a start. I need need something to start growing within me. God, breathe on me. A conception. Conceiving something. Allowing it to grow within you. An idea, a plan, a thought. Listen to this. Don't allow the world to abort that which God is trying to birth through your life. Hmm. See, because a lot of us will, 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 yeah, God, do something in my life. Conceive something in my life. And you'll start going forward with it. And then the devil will lie to you and say, you can't handle this and you can't do this. And so you spiritually abort what God has conceived within you. And you trash it. Life. That was within you, like a natural abortion has been tossed aside. The value of something that is precious is no longer living because you listen to a lie. The same thing in the spirit. God is conceiving something within you. Let it go through its natural term and let it go through the production and let it go all the way till God says that's it. Hmm. Breathe on me, God. Breathe on me, God. Maybe some of y'all are past the conception form. Some of y'all are past conceiving. And, but God wants to understand that he's breathing a commission on you. What is commission? It's the act of granting certain powers or authority to carry out a particular task. And I like this last part. And the task has been authorized. Some of y'all are waiting for permission. Some of y'all are waiting for permission to do what God's called you to do. It's been authorized. He, he's put a commission on you. I, I said, yes, do it. That which is authorized by the king can never be forbidden by the enemy. Hmm. The devil can't say, no. That ain't going to happen. How dare you? I don't know if you've ever studied anything about kingship or anything about castles and, and, and all these different things, but you didn't go against what the king said because once the king declared it, it was law. And once the king said this is it, that was it. And nobody came against it because if they did, death was before them. The enemy cannot come to you and tell you what God has ordained and God has authorized. It is now forbidden. No, not today, devil. I don't think so. You're not going to lie to me me and tell God has authorized the task he's commissioned it within me he has breathed it on me and furnished me and he's already in his mind has finished it all I've got to do is walk it out last one last one when God breathes on you he breathes a completion The Bible says that he will bring things to a completion. He will make sure they are finished properly. The act, what is completion? The act of finishing something in its entirety. There's a scripture that I forgot where it's found, but I love it. It says this. It says, um, once you start the ball rolling, finish it with the same enthusiasm. See, we get all pumped up about something and, oh, I want to do this and, oh, I want to do that. And then it kind of dies out and you start something new and it's just some, something sitting in the garage that never got finished. You know, this church isn't something that we're just, oh, yeah, whew. after a year, eh, you want to do something else, Melissa? You know, let's, I don't know, maybe we turn it into a restaurant, you know, uh, one of those uh, get air things, put a bunch of trampolines everywhere. You know, we'll do something with it. Let's shut down the EWC and. Turning it into air part two. You know, let's do something. No, the, we're, not, we're not just a fly by night. This isn't something we're just, let's see what happens. No, no, we're going to see it through to completion. And completion doesn't mean that when we get the last nail in the wall. And it doesn't mean that when we get the carpet on the floor. And it, it doesn't mean that when it's completed with paint on the outside of the building. That's not what God's talking about. Completion is you're going to do this until I come back and say you're done. 
because this isn't about you and it's not about building your name. It's about getting as many people to say yes to me before I say, come on, let's go home. Hmm. Completion. Completion. Listen to this. Completion came on the cross while commitment starts within the individual heart. See, when Christ died on the cross, he said, it is finished. See, he's already brought a finish to it. In his mind, it's already completed. In his mind, this is going to go all the way to the end. In his mind, what he has for you to do is what you're going to do all the way to the end. It's completed. But commitment, you got to decide on the commitment. God, God isn't going to force you to commit. He wants you to commit, but you've got to make up your mind that you're committed. Me and Melissa have gathered hands and we said, this is it. We've committed to this. Hell or high water? Five people or 5,000? We'll do this. Completion was on the cross. Christ already knew we were going to do this. Nothing takes God by surprise. But commitment is something we had to make up in our own minds. What atmosphere you breathe in is up to you. But let me tell you, the one that goes against God is the one that will be your demise. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So can I just encourage you here today and tell you this? Take a breath. Everybody just take a breath. Just blow it out, blow it out. Do it two more times. One, 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 one more time, one more time. When the things of life come against you, here's some spiritual advice for you. Just breathe. Let God do what he wants in your life. Let the current constantly be on you. The pneuma, the breath of God, let it consume you. That you never get to the place where you're <clears throat> that you've adapted so much to the things of the world that it's even harder for you to go back to where you need to be. Because then you're stuck being, <clears throat> oh, I guess I'll <clears throat> And you don't survive. Let God breathe. Breathe on you. He's no longer in motion. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's always there with you.